Jesus on the inside. Yep. If I can get it to switch again. No, it doesn't want to switch. Here we go. Good? Okay. Now it's not switching. <laughs> oh, there we go. There it is. Jesus. Trying to pick a key here because the one they've got written in is not. Five. We can go to the next one if you want. Okay, let's try B flat. Okay. Well, Jesus, Jesus on, on the inside, inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life! Jesus, Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life! Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Oh, what a change in my life. Jesus on 
Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. out and touch the Lord. So reach out and touch the Lord as he passes by. You will find he's not too busy to hear your hearts cry. He is passing by this moment. Your need to supply so reach out and touch the Lord as he goes by oh reach out and touch the Lord as he passes by you will find he's not too busy to hear Reach out and touch the Lord. 
Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Mm, hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. While we're standing tonight, while we're standing tonight, let's do that. Let's just reach out. If you've got personal needs, I have a, a need that we need to pray about tonight as a church. Um, Ed Shearer uh, family came to church here for a couple of years. This has been a while back. Many of you don't know him, but he was here in this church and a, a great guy, a great family. His, um, his wife has got LDS. Is it ALS? That's what it is. And we got a report today that she's not doing good at all. So would you pray with me tonight as you pray for your needs for the Ed Shearer family? Let's pray together right now. Let's Come on, we can reach out and touch the Lord. Come on, that's what God... That's why the church is still here, praise God, is because we have that ability in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. We pray for Katrina. We pray for Karina, I mean, Karina. We pray for her in Jesus' name. We pray for Kevin Morris. We pray for Jason, Lord God, tonight with stage four cancer. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will touch him right now. Touch him right now. Right now. Come on, I'm telling you, the Lord is here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Yes, Lord God. Yes, Lord Jesus. Touch and strengthen, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Touch these families, Lord God, all of them. Touch them, Lord God. Move upon them, Lord God, for special, special miracles in Jesus' name. Yes, your miracle-working power, Lord God, is amongst us. I trust that, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Yes, Lord, we have confidence in you. We have confidence in what you're doing. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you the praise and the glory, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. What a confidence. What a fellowship in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. You can be seated. Maybe um, Tom and, um, and um, your first name just escaped me. I'm sorry, that's okay. Um, uh, Chris, I knew you were, it was a C word. But, um, <laughs> well, it could have been. Yeah, I was called Fred today, actually Frank. I was called Frank. When they called for my Bible study at the jail today, they called me Frank, so I guess I owe somebody something like that. But uh, what he's passing out right now is we're passing out the 30 days of prayer and fasting, kind of an agenda, something that you can kind of look at and maybe kind of get a target and, um, and maybe get yourself involved in Jesus' name. Um, the United Pentecostal Church International Organization has used the month of January now for a number of years as kind of a launching pad for the year, and of course, 30 days of prayer and fasting is what is involved. What we have done in this church, of course, is try to get as many people involved in fasting and prayer as we can, and that is our goal. We feel like this is what the Lord would want, and so we're hoping tonight that this will be something that you can um, uh, uh, get involved in, in Jesus' name. What we have done this month, we normally, we have times of prayer in this church at different times during the week. Um, uh, most of you are aware of it. On Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, there's concerted prayer that is gone here or going on in this church building every Tuesday night. 
And then, of course, before every service, a half hour to 45 minutes before every service we have in this church, um, Sunday and Wednesday, we have prayer going on. And a lot of times you can hear it when you go into the back there, and that's, that's what's going on. And then what we've done for the month of January is we've added two Saturday nights, two Saturday nights, which would be next Saturday, not this coming Saturday, but um, the second and the fourth Saturday is what we've added here at the church again from five to six. And so there is lots of corporate opportunity for you to get involved in prayer. We want you to, in Jesus' name. And it does. It makes a big difference. But that's not the only time that you can get involved in prayer. What I would encourage you to do, and I, I hesitate to set a time limit on this because that sometimes can be a stumbling block, but set a time every day, even if it's 30 seconds, even if it's two minutes, even if it's five minutes, take that amount of time and commit to it every day this month and see what happens. Just see what kind of an awareness uh, will happen in your life and see what God would have you to do. My prayer is that it will go on. That after 30 days or 28 days or whatever it is of you doing that, you will see the benefit of that. And you will begin to say, well, listen, I'm not going to quit after 30 days. I'm going to continue to do it. And what will happen is it will develop into a spiritual habit. You will begin to do it. And boy, I mean to tell you folks, you, you'd be surprised what those kind of things can do, not only over the short term, but what they can do over the long term. And so consider that. This is just an opportunity. Amen. Years ago when I came into the church, they used other methods to try to get us involved, and I'm not here to be critical in that type of thing. Um, but my point is, is that when people want to do something, it makes a big, huge difference. But sometimes before people want to do something, what they have to do is they have to begin to see the benefits, the benefits of doing it. And so um, that in itself can become a tremendous incentive. So hopefully this will be the case for you. This coming Sunday morning at 8.30 um, at the church in the fellowship hall, we're going to be having our annual bread breakfast. And what that has to do with, of course, is people who have read through their Bibles or gone through their Bibles in its entirety in a year, we honor you. And we do that by cooking breakfast for you. We do need a count. If you're going to be here, I would appreciate if you'd let Sister Carnahan know. You can text her, whatever the case is. But by Friday, let her know that you're going to be in this bread breakfast. The reason being is we need to have a number so we can know how much food to prepare. Even if you haven't read your Bible through is it in or, or gone through the Bible in its entirety in a calendar year, you're still welcome to come. We just ask that you give a, an offering for, for your breakfast. But uh, the point of it is, is you're welcome. Tremendous testimonies are given at this time about what God is doing through the habit of going through the Bible. And so again, it's just one of those opportunities that you have as an individual to get yourself closer to God. And I think the two that we've just introduced here are, are good ones. Prayer, reading your Bible. Those are two great classic areas in your life that you can begin to do it. So that's this Sunday morning at 8.30 here at the church. And so if you're planning on coming, we want you to be here, and we're going to honor those that have done this, and, um, and hopefully we can get more people to be inspired to do it in Jesus' name. Praise God. Well, this is the first service of 2018. Amen. Anybody besides me wrote 2017? Sure, we do that, yeah. You know. Um, but, um, but we'll get into the habit of doing it. Uh, probably by the end of the month, everybody will have it down, that type of thing. But we are into a new year. Wow. You know, 2017 was awesome, wasn't it? God is good. Amen. Maybe you had some challenges, but believe me, praise God, 2018 is built for revival. It is. It's, we're going to have revival, praise God, because God has ordained it. What we're going to do tonight now is we're going to go into the second session of our discipleship class. The last time, or I should say the last sessions we dealt with, had to do with empowerment. And we talked about being empowered to become, empowered to worship, empowered to overcome. And then the last week we talked about empowered for a mission. Let's not forget these things. That's why you got the books. That's why you have the material that you can write down so that you can remember these things. What we're going to deal with now is we're going to deal with seasons, praise God. And seasons are the will of God. Amen. A good story, I won't go into it in detail because I don't want to do away from this Bible study, but a good story to, to talk about or to, to recognize a season 
is in 2 Samuel chapter number 6. This was after uh, David, and I'm not finding fault with David, but he did mishandle the ark. He didn't handle it the way God wanted him to handle it, and I won't go into the detail there, which caused um, an accident to happen, and of course Uzziah lost his life. Has anybody ever read that story? Well, that was the Ark of the Covenant that, that they were dealing with in, on a new cart, and what had happened was Obed-Edom became a blessed person because of that. What happened was David, after that happened, he was very fearful of the things of God, and he just allowed the Ark of the Covenant to remain at Obed-Edom's house. And the Bible says for 90 days, which I don't think is an accident, because if you think about seasons, now I understand out here we can go from winter to spring and maybe even catch a little summer. We can do that. So that's when you talk about, um, you know, seasons, you know, you, you have to be careful that you don't, put Wyoming in there because we could go into a lot of different seasons all of within one week. But traditionally, a season is how many months? Three months. And how many days is that? 90 days. And so think about that. I've heard it said that if you can begin to habitually do something for a season or for 90 days, there's a good chance that you'll, be able, you'll do that the rest of your life. So consider that. Well, in this case, in this story, yeah, that is, is that the Ark of the Covenant did not go into Jerusalem where it was intended to go. It stopped at Obed-Edom's house. And guess what? Because the, the, the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament represented what? What did it represent? The Ark of the Covenant. The presence of God. That's what it did. Remember that? Well, because the presence of the Lord in the Ark of the Covenant was in Obed-Edom's house for 90 days, his house began to be blessed. And David noticed that. And, of course, that gave him the incentive to try again. I like that. You know, you make mistakes. How many here has ever made any mistakes? Sure, we're all on common ground there, aren't we? We don't like to admit it sometimes, but we do. But the neat thing about mistakes is we can learn from them. And this is what seasons can help us to do. We go into seasons in our life that sometimes we just have to learn some things from. Now, we're going to talk about different seasons during this, the, these next four weeks. We're going to talk tonight about the season of new beginnings. We all need it. Sometimes we just got to start over. Sometimes you got to forget that which was behind you, not that you forget entirely, but you learn from it, but then you go on. Okay, next week we're going to talk about a season of waiting, waiting upon the Lord. And then the next week we'll talk about there's even a season of famine. Sometimes God will put shortages in our life, you know. And a lot of times they're designed so we won't depend on certain things. Yeah, so we'll depend on God. See, that's what human beings can do. Sometimes we can get, sometimes things can begin to flow into our lives and we start getting more dependent on them than we do on the one that sent them. And so we have to be careful. So there's a reason. And then the last week, we are going to talk about a season of blessing. So you want to be in these sessions. They're going to help you, praise God. Tonight, we want to talk uh, uh, about the season of, of course, of, 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 of beginnings. And let's just go right straight to our Bible study. The, one of the key scriptures here tonight has to do with the eighth chapter of the book of Genesis. Um, those of you that are avid readers of the Bible, you'll recognize this is after the flood. After the flood. Remember Noah? You know, he built that ark, and, and of course, it was a, a, a very, very um, tough time on the earth. And people who did not get into that ark, they lost their lives. But after that episode was over, God began to restore things. And one of the things that he brought forth that is not brought forth before this time, there's no record in the garden that there was any seasons. You know, it's kind of like Hawaii. It was all kind of the same, you know, nice weather, that type of thing. But God instituted here seasons. Read it with me, or I'll read it and you can listen. While the earth remaineth, and we're still there, by the way, it says seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. See what God said? He said it's going to go on like that while the earth remains, even during the millennium period. While this earth here remains, we're going to have that. And so we have to expect that. We have to expect there's going to be seasons in our life. Now, understandably, we like to take it right straight to the, to the spiritual realm, which is a good place to take it. But nevertheless, recognize that even in your life, there are seasons, seasons that God will allow to happen. 
And sometimes what he's trying to do is develop some good spiritual habits in our life. And so this is a good thing. This is not something that is a, uh, that a, that a, that, that is a bad thing. It's a good thing. God wants to help you and I to understand. Now, our new birth, and we've talked a lot about the new birth experience, this is where we begin with the kingdom of God. It's not where we begin in our life down here. We, we begin our life down here when we're born, you know. But when it comes to God, when it comes to the kingdom of God, our new birth is the ultimate new beginning. That's why the Bible says, I think it's in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, if any person be in Christ, what does it say after that? They are, not are going to be. It doesn't say that. It says, as soon as you are born again, you are a new creature. Praise God. Now consider that. Sometimes we forget that with all of the stuff that's going on around us and all of the mistakes that are being made. We forget the fact that we've already, if you've been born again, you've already got a new beginning. Come on, you don't get it any better than that, praise God. And I thank God for that new beginning. I don't know about you, but I'm not proud of my past. I'm not, and I'm not going to sit here and, and dwell on that, but I'm going to learn from it, obviously. But the bottom line, I'm glad that God gave me a second chance. I'm glad he did that. Isn't that wonderful? Come on, you and I serve a very good God, folks. We don't serve some meanie up there. Oh, hallelujah. We don't serve a mean God. We serve a very loving, kind God that gives everybody, all, every person the opportunity for a new beginning. Amen. That's why you, the best thing you can tell people when the opportunity comes is that you can be born again. Amen. I mentioned it again in my Bible study at the jail today. Do you, have you ever heard of baptism in the name of Jesus and the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues? And they hadn't. And I said, well, this is something that's for you. And I introduced some scripture to them, sowed a few seeds, and just went right on with my Bible study. See, folks, I'm telling you something. This is the good news. Hallelujah. And you and I need to be, be you know, um, uh, ecstatic enough about it that we'll tell people about it in Jesus' name. Praise God. Don't keep that all to yourself. Now, the Scripture says in Galatians chapter number 2, it says this. It talks about the fact that I am crucified with Christ. Now, this is Paul telling the church this. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Do you see that? That's what happens with that new birth. Christ who was with you. Come on, I know a lot of good people that God is with. But boy, there's a huge difference between God being with you and God being in you. And that's what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is all about. And then it says, and the life that I now live. Everybody say now. now. It says, in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is all part of the season of a new beginning. There it is. And folks, I don't know how many times you can start this over. You can just keep it coming in Jesus' name. And so this is what, it, what, what God wants to help happen to us. Amen. And so I believe a lot of times what will happen during these seasons is we will see growth. We will see maturity come in. I'm not talking about larger bank accounts or nicer homes or, or, or more beautiful cars. This is what our culture teaches us. But what in the kingdom of God, you'll begin to see maturity. You'll begin to see people being able to have more stamina in their life to withstand some of the pr pressures of this life. And that all happens because you and I had a brand new beginning. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Come on, I feel like we ought to just lift up our hands right now and give God praise for what he's done. Come on, we serve an awesome God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. My goodness. Oh, you better believe it. We serve a mighty God. Mm, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. But, you know, just one of the uh, uh, good analogy to remember is just the same as the analogy of the natural birth, is that there are times, you know, when that child is going to, you know, it's, it's in this different stage and that different stage. But the natural thing is for that child to grow up. And so this is why God will allow things to come into our life. A lot of times it's for the purpose. I tell folks, I've had, I had three of them and, and glad for all three of my children. But I tell folks a lot of times when they're having their first child, I said one of the biggest reasons God's given you children is so you'll grow up. 
so you will grow up. Amen. And that's what a lot of times kids will bring, we hope. Now, understandably, sometimes that don't happen. I wish it did, but sometimes it doesn't, you know. But the bottom line is we need to grow up, and sometimes God will bring areas or things into our life that will cause that to happen. Praise God. And so this is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. This is what God did. Praise God. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what's one of the major themes of 1 Corinthians 13? Does anybody remember? Love. You just can't get, you can't get around that, you know. And one of the things that Paul is doing is he's saying, here's a, if you want a good attitude, here's a good attitude, the attitude of love. You know? And then he goes into the first few verses and he explains it, what it is. That's why studying that chapter is a good thing. If you really want to know what love is all about, man, there it is. There's, about, there's ten commandments of love. There's five principles of love right there in the first eight or ten chapter, or verses. And you, you can discover that for yourself. Am I maturing in love? And this will help you to kind of get your little timeline, what's going on here. But one of the things that Paul said that love will do, or one of the byproducts of having love in your life, is this right here. When I was a child, and we all were. Come on, that's what we start out with. Scripture talks about being born again, which means you're a babe in Christ. Okay? So we're all there sometimes. But the bottom line is Paul was making reference to the fact that when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child. This is why I did it. Sometimes I'll have parents go, man, why is he acting like that? Or why is she acting like that? And I'll just walk over to them and tap them on the shoulder and say, they're kids. I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying, come on, look at, it's pretty obvious to me. Now, I'm kind of glad it's your kid. Not my, no, I'm just kidding. But, I mean, the bottom line is, I mean, it's a, they're children. That's what happens. But the bottom line is, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, okay? Paul is talking about the fact that there's times when we need to grow up. Then what happens? What's the first thing? Not acting like a man. That's not what he's saying. He said, I became a man. And because I became a man, I put away certain practices. And this is what God can help us to do. Again, this is not a blame game or you're better than I am or that kind of thing. It's a natural process of a new season. A season is supposed to bring some things into our lives. But what I've found in my own life sometimes is I resist it. I don't like it. I don't want that to happen right now. And boy, I'll tell you something, folks. I got to get over that. Because if it comes from God, i got to learn to say, I want it whether I like it or not. And so this is part of the maturity process that God puts in our lives. We can learn to grow up like that. And so this is what Paul is saying. I put away some things. Can you think of some childish things, um, maybe even in the natural realm, that you should put away? Oh. <laughs> can somebody say amen to that? Yeah. How about not being able to get up in the morning. Ooh, you ever had a kid like that? You know, got a job, and then, you know, the first two weeks he can't even hardly get out of bed, you know, and that type. That's kind of, in my opinion, a little bit of a childish thing, isn't it? Somebody else, what, what do we got? Over here, childish things. What are some of the childish things we got to put away? Ooh. Fighting and complaining. Oh, whining. Yeah, that's a big one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I don't know how it was at your home, but when, when we had a home, there, there wasn't a lot of that that was allowed. And it just, what, what it was. I mean, you came to the table, and whatever was there, you ate. And I mean, it wasn't like, well, I'll think about it. No. <laughs> it was, that's just a spoken rule. But that's how it was in the home that I was raised. Whining things. Somebody else. One, one or two more. What is it over here? Tantrums, yeah, having a, anybody ever seen a kid do that? What's your first response? Come on, come on. No, I'm not, I don't work for the family services either, okay? But what is your first, first response? Oh, let me have that kid for about 30 seconds. <laughs> and come, am I the only one that thinks like that? Come on, now I don't do it if it's not my child, man. I'm not going to do that. But you know yourself, that's the first thing you'd like to do. Yeah. Okay, one more. We're talking childish things. How about over here in the cheap seats? Huh? <laughs> what is it? Road rage. Boy, that's kind of a newer one, isn't it? 
Yeah, I got to get over that. I, I know a lot of older people that still have a problem with that one. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. One more. Yeah, yeah. That's part of immaturity, isn't it? Yeah. And you know something, Sister Sandy? Sometimes that can even be a pride issue. But nevertheless, these are childish things that seasons of new beginnings can really help us to get through. And maybe we can begin to change the way we think. Isn't that remarkable? Now, that's all what God has in store for us down here right now. You don't have to wait to get to New Jerusalem to get this going in your life. And so this is why we should begin to learn how to welcome new seasons in our life, that God is going to help us with these things. And just like he's going to help me with this remote to get that, it isn't doing working, Sister Carney, and I'm sorry. Can you switch? Please. Try it again. Ah, there it is. Okay, look at what it says there. It says, each new season allows us to experience the learning that will lead us to spiritual maturity. And that's one of the reasons why you should, and I should welcome these new seasons. That God is bringing some new things into my life so that I can learn how to become not only a, um, a closer person to him, but someone who's got some spiritual maturity, praise God. Because listen to me, folks, this world really needs this. They don't need people that, that, will, that will drop people, you know, on a, you know in just like that. They need people who's got long-suffering, people who know how to have patience, people who know how to have love people, even when they're unlovable. That's what this world needs. I didn't say, I didn't say condone or, 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 or make excuses for their behavior, but the world needs someone who can reach out to them, praise God, with that kind of spiritual maturity. That's what makes the mission that we talked about last week, you know, happen, is if we can learn to put some Christ-like traits in our life, this is what will happen. So each new season will bring this about. God will say, listen, I'm going to bring some change into your life. And that's why we have to rec recognize that it probably won't be for a day or two, that God will begin to deal with us over a period of weeks and sometimes months. Literally, that's what he will do because he knows what it takes for us to get it ingrained in our brain. And so you and I must expect that kind of thing to happen, praise God, and realize that it's a good thing, that it's a good thing that God has got this in our, in our life and he's going to help us to come to spiritual maturity and some great things are going to begin to happen in Jesus' name, praise God. Now, Ephesians chapter number 4 talks about this Oh, kind of, I know, and much more. But let's just go down the, the scripture here. Notice what it says. Let no corrupt uh, communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Now, it's talking about uh, spiritual maturity here, obviously, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So verse 29 is talking about how we talk. What's our talking like? Are we always putting somebody down? Are we always looking at the negative side of something? Are we always looking at something that's bad? Now, again, I'm not finding fault here. I'm just, I'm, I'm just throwing out some seed here. See, how you speak a lot of times is going to determine, praise God, how much maturity you have in your life. And then it goes on to say, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, obviously, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. We've got to learn to yield to the Spirit instead of grieving it, okay? And then it goes on to say, let all. Boy, that a double -L shows up a lot in the Bible, doesn't it? Yeah, all bitterness. Grieving the Holy Ghost, I have it written in my Bible here. And there's three, three things that happen, praise God, that, that, um, that, that, th that we can do to the Holy Ghost. And if I can find them here real quick, real, real quick. Yeah, here it is. The, there's, there's three things, Brother Mike. You can write these down. This is just a side note. There's one place in Acts chapter number 7 where it talks about resisting the Holy Ghost. That means to come against. That means to oppose it. Okay, then it talks about grieving the Holy Ghost, which means to sadden, distress it. I don't know if you realize this or not, but do you know you can make God sad? Sure you can, and so can I. And then the last one is to quench the Spirit which means to put it out. And so these are three areas we want to stay away. Instead of resisting and grieving and quenching the Spirit, we need to learn to submit and yield to the Spirit. 
That's what we need to learn to do. And that, a lot of times, comes with spiritual maturity. That you begin to yield to God no matter what's going on around you. No matter how many people are doing it against you, you're not going to do it against them. Now, understandably, I'm not telling you this is, this is, this is easy. I told my class today at the jail, I said, one of the most misunderstood things about Christianity, I, I feel, and it's, in, in my opinion, it's, 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 it's a stumbling block, is that Christianity is going to be easy. I don't know who brought that one up. And I'm not going to tell you something that it's the hard, you know, it's, it's hard 24-7. But I will tell you when it comes down to the, to, to, to the brass tacks of the thing, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. And one of the reasons it is is because it's so constant. It's always there. Christianity is something I have to put in my life 24-7. And that's why it's different. So it's going to be tough. There's going to be times when it's going to be hard. And you must understand and you must prepare yourself for this. One of the ways that I prepare myself for it is by constantly telling me, it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. Praise God. And so this is what we can keep telling ourselves. Did that answer your question? Okay, let's go on. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with malice. Now, I won't go into those words. You can study them out for yourself, but some of these things are the things that we struggle with. And then it says, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. I'm telling you, in those four verses right there, will give you and I enough things to work on for a lot more than just one season. But let me just put it to you this way. When are we going to start working on them? Well, I, that's, that would be the, 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 the thing to do, but I'm just saying that's why God will put things in your life that will say, okay, now we're going to work on this. You know how it is? You work next to somebody that's just is driving you up the wall, and God said, well, you know, we needed to work on something. And I brought somebody into your life that's going to help you with that. Hey, I'm telling you. I remember uh, David, um, I forget what his last name, David, um, guy from uh, San Diego. Um, Gray, David Gray. He's dead and gone now. He's an old elder in the church. I remember one time he came and he taught the ministers and wives up at uh, Cody. This was probably 25 years ago. And I'll never forget, he taught on a lesson like this. And you know what he said? And I believe this. He said, these are grace developers. These are people that God sends into your life so you'll recognize and realize how much grace you need. And then he turned around and he said, do you realize that you're probably a grace developer to somebody else too? Oh, we never thought of that one, did we? Oh, we don't like to think about that one, do we? But it's the truth. It's the truth. And so this is how we look at things. And so this, these four verses here in Ephesians, you know, are just talking about putting away childish things. And a lot of the de things that we're dealing with in life, uh, you can say what you want, but you can classify them under that. We're just being kids. We're just being, you know, babies about it. And again, I've got to be careful here. I don't want to offend anybody, but the bottom line is, folks, you've got, you got to call it the way it is. And sooner or later, praise God, you and I need to begin to grow up. And so this is what God will do. This is why he will bring these seasons of change into our lives, praise God. One of the greatest hopes that God gives to mankind on this earth, in my opinion, is that change. I can change. I do not have to stay the same. I do not have to remain in this condition for the rest of my life. And I don't know how about you, but I can tell you how many times that has given me blessed hope. Blessed hope, praise God. And so consider these things. These lessons aren't designed to intimidate you. These lessons are designed to encourage you. This is what God wants to do. Can somebody give me an amen? amen. Now, the scripture talks about relationships, and I don't know how you feel about relationships, but relationships are very, very important. I have four of them that are ongoing in my life all the time. I do. I am a son of God. So there's a relationship with God in the sonship. I have an ongoing servant role that God puts me in all the time. He, and, it, and sometimes that changes. This last past year, it changed. I was a servant when I was district superintendent. Then they elected me to become the secretary. But it's still a very servant role. 
And so God is ongoing all the time. Now, these are relationships with God because if I do it just for you, I'll get upset. But if I begin to do it because I'm living for God, I'm going to tell you something, folks. That can take me a whole lot further. And so somebody here needs to hear that. I just felt that in the Holy Ghost right there. Is you need to start doing things as unto the Lord. That's where it comes to. And then the last two are, are, are of course, the bride. I am going to be part and are part of the bride. Amen. And I don't have a problem with that. And then the last relationship we'll touch on right here in John 15, uh, 14, Jesus began to share with them, you are my friends. Now, I don't know about you folks, but that's quite a privilege. And he says it comes with kind of a disclaimer here. You're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. See, that's how you can tell that people are growing. Amen. Is that maybe they question commands, but they'll still do them. They'll still do them. And you say, do them until when? Do them until you get the understanding. And that might take most of your life. That might take all of your life. I don't know. I can't tell you exactly when God is going to give you the understanding. I know that, that one day he will. But the point of it is, is that the first thing God will do is he will deal with us as friends, and that means commandments. And so get used to that. There might be something in the way of, oh, I, man, I, I feel a confirmation coming up here. There might be a, uh, somebody in here or somebody's in here that God has been dealing with you about the commandments of the Bible. And he's taking you through a season now. And he's testing you. Are you going to do it? Or are you going to sit there and argue about it? Are you going to sit there and wonder about it for the rest of your life? Or are you going to trust me enough to start doing it? Come on, that's what I, I'm looking for some maturity to happen even after tonight's session. That God is going to help us to recognize what he's doing in our lives, praise God. And I mean, you can, this goes from A to Z, praise God. And so God will deal with this because he wants to deal with it. You know what a friend will do? Come on, a friend will tell their friends a whole lot more than they tell the people that are just acquaintances. And God's got a lot he wants to share with you. And so this is why he'll bring that season into your life and my life that will, that will begin to bolster that up a little bit. Am I really a friend of God? Will I really do what he wants me to do regardless of the opposition? Now, that's a good question to ask ourselves from time to time. Where is my relationship in regards to being a friend of God at right now? Well, you have to answer that one because God challenges me on that from time to time. He does. And so this is what he will do, praise God. Now, somewhere through the changing seasons, and this is something that somebody has said one time, one thing that you and I are never going to be um, uh, exempt from is there's going to be change. We all must grow up and experience a maturity in love. Everybody say in love. But not just in love in anything. See, we need to learn how to love God. That's the first thing. When Jesus was, um, and he was challenged from time to time, and, and there was a guy that came to him one day and said, okay, what's the greatest commandment? What's the chief one? What's the one we should be working for? And you've got to understand, this guy was knowledgeable of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, they had over 600 of them. So which one are you going to choose? And Jesus said, okay, I'm going to simplify this for you. He said, the first and the greatest commandment. Does anybody remember what it was? Love God. Love the Lord God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. And so this is what we have to do with our maturity and love, that our love grows to the point that we love God enough that we will do what he tells us to do. That's where you can see if people are growing in that area. If you're still hooked on this, well, if he does this, then I'll do this mentality. You've got to understand you're stuck. You're stuck in a rut, and God wants to bring a season into your life that will get rid of that rut, that will say, Wait a minute, I'll do what you want me to do, God, no matter what. I don't care what she says. I don't care what he says. I don't care what they say. You say it in your word, and I'm going to do it in the name of Jesus, and praise God, we're going to grow together in Jesus' name. Oh, folks, I'll tell you something. I feel the Holy Ghost again here tonight in Jesus' name. There is some spiritual growth in this place. The seeds are already there in Jesus' name. 
Oh, what a wonderful place to be, folks. What a wonderful place to be. And so we all must grow up and experience maturity in love for the Lord, and it's characterized by faithfulness to His Word. There's where you can tell if people are really growing in love. And our submission to His will. There's where we struggle sometimes. It's not that we don't know what God wants us to do. Come on, don't play those games. Don't play those games. Ignorance is not bliss. Come on, you know what God wants you to do. If you're reading your Bible and you're coming to church on a regular basis, I'm telling you there's enough Holy Ghost and Spirit and Word around here that there's plenty. You know what God wants you to do. But the bottom line is are we going to become submissive? And remember something about being submissive, folks. It's not when you agree with God. That is not true submissiveness. True submissiveness is when you don't agree with him, but you'll still do it. And I'll tell you what will happen when you begin that habit is God will bring some understanding to your life. Amen. He will bring that understanding. All of a sudden, one morning, you'll wake up and you'll say, man, I know what he's doing now. He saved me from a lot. And this is what God wants to do, praise God. And so keep these things in mind. These are, this, this is just privileges that God gives us for being in his kingdom. And so seasons are transitions. This is a lot of what happens. You know how it goes in here. You know, we, and this is one of the, the struggles I've always had with Wyoming, is, you know, I come from Iowa, and Iowa's cold, folks. It's even colder in Iowa than it is in Wyoming. I'm telling you, it is. You get that humidity and you get 10 below zero. It is absolutely, it just bites at you. But the thing about Iowa is around the last part of March, usually, every year, it starts getting springtime. And you can start planning on putting even a garden in by the first of April. But how many's tried to do that out here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we had 60 degrees last week, but boy, this week we got a foot of snow on the ground. So again, don't compare seasons with Wyoming, okay? We can, we can go back and forth at least five or six times before we get it here, you know. But traditionally, seasons begin to have a transition. You'll begin to see the weather change. You'll begin to see some things come. And this is, even Jesus talked about this with his second coming. He talked about there would be a season before it came, and we would begin to see the signs. And so seasons are transitions that lead us to transformation. They will actually lead us into the place. And a lot of times this is what God will do is he will begin, um, begin showing us little by little. That's how the scripture says it works. Little by little, here, here a little, there a little, precept upon precept, line upon line, you know, that type of thing. This is what God will do. And all of a sudden we'll begin to see exactly what God wants us to do. Amen. Just simple steps. Just being obedient to God. Remember, our love for God is going to be challenged. It is. And you and I might as well realize that there's probably going to be many, many seasons in our life that are designed to strengthen that love relationship between you and God. Amen. I'm thinking of an incident with a man in the Old Testament, Abraham. And Abraham went through many seasons. But one of the things that God promised him was a child to that wife. And, man, it happened. And, wow, you know, that 99th year of Abraham is, was a transitional year for him. Something happened to that man that you can follow in Scripture. But here it is. He got the promise. How good he must have felt. Man, went through that. How many has gone through a trial and said, well, at least I don't have to go through trials anymore? Oh, that's unrealistic, isn't it? Yeah. But the bottom line is, here's Abraham. He goes through it, and here 12, 13 years later, what does God do? We're going to strengthen his love for me. Oh, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to ask him to give back that, what he really cherishes. Wow. Man, that's a, that's a game breaker, isn't it? It really is. And so you and I can expect that kind of treatment. And I know I'm not telling you he's going to have you, t although some of you'd probably like to, take your kids up on the hill and sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. hey, God, I, that's you today, especially right now, man. I want both of them. I want them up there, you know. that No, God says, no, no, I won't leave that one up to you, you know. But the bottom line is you're going to find similarities like that. There's going to be things that God is going to bless in your life. But are we going to learn to bless the blessings 
or love the blesser? See, this is what we have to ask ourselves sometimes. I want to fall more and more in love with him. Not with these things. And I know that's hard because my flesh likes these things. But my soul and my spirit wants to know more about him. So think about that transformation, praise God. God will do that. And what a blessed relief that as the seasons have changed our circumstances, they have also developed something in us. Come on, character. Come on, we find ourselves able to resist temptation like we've never been able to do it before. Why is that? Because God has built some character up in us. We don't care who's looking. It doesn't matter if nobody's looking. It's kind of like Joseph's attitude when the lady was saying, hey, listen, nobody knows you and I are here. And Joseph said, God does. See, that's the kind of thing that godly love will develop, praise God, is you and I will be constantly aware of the ever-present God. And so this is what will make a transition in our life, is that we know that wherever we're at, we don't hide from him. And so that's why doing it unto the Lord is a good thing. It's what God wants us to learn to do, praise God. And it'll begin to develop character in our life. And character is something that, you know, you can't go to Walmart and buy. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care where you get all this education. That's not the kind of character we want to get. We want to get the true character that God puts in us through his word and through his spirit. And that's why we have to come to him in Jesus' name. And so these character building sessions that we have will be part of the season of change that will come into our life. Scripture says something that uh, I remember the first few times I read it, it kind of staggered me a little bit because I was under the impression that God loved everybody. And you've got to be careful with that one. Now listen to me, folks. I know this one here can get written off. God makes his love available to everybody. But if you study this scripture right here, folks, you're going to see something. That Esau did something. Come on, Esau did something that God didn't like. Now you can, you can cover that up as much as you want, but folks, there's something that happened there with a season of transition. And I'll tell you what part of it was, praise God, is that God had instituted into the situation the birthright. But apparently Esau didn't think anything of it. Now you can transition that into the New Testament. God has worked into the equation of mankind in the New Testament, the new birth experience. And that new birth is for everybody. I don't care if you're an Esau or you're a Jacob. But you've got to understand there's a lot of people out there that have spurred that. They have just literally said, no, I don't want any part of that. Now listen to me, folks. I'm not the judge. But I'm telling you, just like Esau and Jacob, you get God ticked off, you get somebody ticked off. And you must understand, because of Esau's dealing with the birthright, that changed his entire rest of his life. He was not the same from then, then on. You go ahead and study it for yourself. He ended up into a bad marriage. He ended up getting involved with wrong people. He ended up getting in, into the bad part of life. You just study his life out, and you're going to find, man, that guy, he went down a trail that was of no good. And I've seen this sometimes because I do believe in the kingdom of God and in this earth and in a person's lifetime, there are some crossroads where God will absolutely intentionally bring people to a crossroad where they cannot deny that there's something happening. And they got to make a decision. And that decision has got to be made right now. God demands it. Either you accept what I'm doing or you don't. Now listen, folks, I'm not saying that's the final chapter, but I'm telling you when they come to that crossroads and they make the wrong decision, that can take them down a miserable rest of their life. I'm telling you, folks, without God, you can make all the money in the world. Without God, you can have all of the luxuries you want. But I'm going to tell you something. You're going to reach a place, praise God, where none of it matters. 
I'm telling you, that's it. And that's not done because I'm angry. It's done because I got a burden for people. Come on. That's why this message is not just a good message. It's the best message. It's the only message. You must be born again. I believe that everybody in this world is going to come to that crossroads, and they're going to have to decide that being born again is better than being liked by people. It being born again is better than having all the riches in the world. That being born again is better than anything in this life come on I just took 30 seconds and preached do you want to know why because there's a little bit of an ear in here come on that one needs to get through that one we need to understand praise God that God gives everybody the opportunity to be loved by him and one of the ways we become loved by God is to be obedient to his word and when we're obedient to his word the Bible says if we'll draw nigh unto him he'll draw nigh unto us that's how it works on this earth come on God is no respecter of persons he doesn't do this for one people and nobody else Oh, hallelujah. I hope that you can feel the intensity of that. I hope you can feel the intensity of that because that was what it was meant to do. Oh, hallelujah. Listen, folks, I'm trying to develop more long-suffering in my heart, too. But there comes a time when you say, wait a minute. You know what to do. You know what that word says. You're just dancing around it, praise God. It's kind of like the 18th chapter of the book of John, the Gospel of John. They were playing games at the cross. And here the, the, the master of the universe was dying right in front of them, and they couldn't see it. Wow. I'm telling you, folks, it, it blows me away. That's why we, we got to start taking this serious. Amen. Now, you got to understand, God knew what was going to happen between Jacob and Esau. He knew that. That's one of the reasons he told the mother. He said the younger is going to serve, or the, 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 the elder is going to serve the younger. That was prophesied. And that's why you think it was a deception. No, it was the will of God for Jacob to go in and get that birthright. And it was the mom that had to bring it out because the dad didn't have a clue. He was going to give it to Esau, who could have cared less. He could have cared less about the birthright. And God understood that in his heart. That's why I'm telling you, folks, it's very, very serious what we do with the things of God in our heart. I'm not talking about making mistakes. I'm not talking about starting over. I'm not talking about, you know, you know uh, being able to, to, to begin again and that type of thing. I'm just talking about what do we do with the things of God in our life. And that's why God will bring a season into our lives. And I'm not saying it just lasts for three months. Because I see one in, in the book of Luke chapter 13 that lasted three years. Three years the man that Jesus taught come to this tree and there's no fruit. And the first thing the guy said, let's cut it down. My goodness, what are we doing here? But the taskmaster, the guy that was taking care of it, which is a representative of Jesus Christ, representative of Jesus Christ said, no, leave it alone. Because the taskmaster said, these two years I've come and this tree hasn't produced anything. And then the taskmaster came along and said, no, come on. Do one, give me one more year. One more year. And the scripture says that man is going to do everything he could. And he finally said yes. He said if this thing doesn't produce fruit after this, yeah, then we'll cut it down. Now you can say what you want about scriptures and about a loving God, and I believe it all, folks. But I do believe that that loving God has limits. And one of those limits is he'll let everybody know. He'll give everybody a chance. He'll give everybody the opportunity praise God and that's why you and I we must understand that sometimes we got to stand 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 back and if people really don't want to do this okay I'm not going to give up on them but listen I'm not going to let that hold me back and so this is what will happen yeah it's pretty sobering praise God I know why yeah here it is in 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 Hebrews it reiterates this look at listen to what it says follow peace with all men in holiness without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligent lest any man fail of the grace of God how can somebody fail the grace of God you ever think about that I mean God whatever he has can't fail right well here's what I feel when you fail the grace of God is you fail to receive it 
And you must understand, grace isn't sent into our life so that we'll tolerate ourselves. Grace is sent into our life so that we will overcome ourselves. And that's what God will do. He will give you and I the ability to overcome. But listen, it might take a couple of seasons. It might take some work. It might take some diligence. It might take some commitment on our part. And you and I must be willing and prepared to do that. Looking diligence less, diligently lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby, therefore many are defiled. And then it says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person. This is how it describes Esau, who for one morsel of food, let it all go. Wow. I don't know about you guys, but when I read that, I go, man, how little that is when it comes to eternity. But that's the bottom line. Amen. Oh, you can feel that you could cut the sobriety in this place with a knife right now. But God has taken us from one gamut to the other here in this service here. Yeah, this is serious. The scripture says, for you know. Now listen, this is another thing that, that troubles me. It says, for you know that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing. That wasn't a deception, folks. That was not a deception. That was a godly rejection. God rejected Esau. And why did he? Because he was there that day when he came in from the hunting trip. He had planned it. There was a season in, in Esau's life, in my opinion, where things could have improved, but he came in from that hunting trip. He was famished. He was hungry. And he said, my goodness, if I don't eat, I'm going to die, which was a real, real exaggeration, which is usually what we're good at, by the way. And then the Bible says that, that, that he said, what use is that? What use is that birthright to me now? And boy, I mean to tell you, folks, I've had that one bounce around my brain a few times. I'm just being honest with you. What good is the rapture now? I'm going through a pretty tough trial. It could be a lot easier for me to do this now. Come on, don't you tell me I'm the only one that has temptations like that. That's why you and I, God will take us through seasons like that, that we've got to reject that and say, no, living for God is more important than the pleasures of sin for a season. That's what Moses said, by the way. You see, you and I are going to have to come to that kind of a term, that the eternity promises that God has given us are worth more than any of the instant pleasures we can get of this life. And that's what our culture is fighting right now, folks. Everybody wants it right now. Everybody wants to live for God and go to heaven, but they want to have pleasures right now. And the Bible says you can't have it both ways. You can, and I can't either. That's why these seasons are designed to help us to make decisions that will become life-changing decisions where we won't even go there anymore. We won't even entertain that anymore. You see what it can do? It can become, like I said, an entire life changer. You've heard of people that were on the road of success. For some reason, they gave it all up for the things of God. And people would come and shake their heads and say, my goodness, what are you doing? You could have had everything. You could have had it all. But no, they said, no, I'd rather have the things of God. Listen to me, folks. Those are the kind of character-building things that God will bring into our lives during the new season. He will help us to contemplate. The scripture says that even though Esau wanted to repent, he found no place. And listen, folks, I'm not even going there tonight, but I'm just saying that's, that's pretty tough stuff. And the Bible says even though he taught it with, or he sought it with tears. I've, I've had people, man, that could break down at a, the drop of a hat over some of the mistakes they've made in life. Listen, we've got to take these things seriously, and God can help us to do it. I've got, got to move on. I, it's tempting for me to preach right now. Okay, the transitions of life will make us or break us. It's this really the bottom line. But it will do one thing. Come on. It'll show us who we are, and we'll have that. 
And listen to me, when that happens, not if, when that happens, don't think that God is in this, well, I guess you're all done type of mode. No, God is just trying to show you what's really there, what's really hindering, what's one of the things that are keeping this back. It's like I said Sunday morning for those of you, of you that weren't here. I talked about there were people in the building and there are people here right now that you're that close. You're right there. And that's what you've got to recognize. Keep on going. I don't know how long that close takes. I don't. And so you've got to understand that, man, I'm going to keep on doing it, praise God, until the end. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Humility is the premium posture is what it talks about for spiritual progress. That's why the Bible says that he resists the proud and he gives more grace to the humble. That's why humility. Humility is not thinking, of, not thinking badly of ourselves. It's not thinking of ourselves at all. It's thinking of him. And so this is what God can help us to do, praise God. Humility is the thing in Jesus' name. See Seasons, seasons. If you want to do yourself a good character study, study the lives of Jacob and Esau. They're, they're, they're tremendous examples. One that I think of is I think of, of Jacob. And Jacob, of course, had two major seasons in his life. I mean, he had more than that, but two that, I can, that stand out to me. One of them was he, after he got the birthright, he had to deal with the son. He had to deal with his brother. And you know, remember the reaction of the brother? I'm going to get him. And of course, mom heard it, and she said, man, I can't have that happening. So what'd she do? Well, I got an uncle. He's got a farm over there and probably put him to work, so we're going to move him on, you know. And so that had to be a sad time in her life. It had to. But it was the will of God. They had to split. We weren't going to work, you know. And so the scripture says that the first night, or I think it's the first night that, that, that Jacob left the home, he came to a place, and he made himself a little bed, put a little rock on top of a rock. I, I still think, man, that had to be hard on his noggin, but whatever. And the scripture says that night he had a dream. Remember that? Remember the dream? Does anybody remember what the dream was? Yeah, the, the angels, angels of God, ascending and descending the throne room of God. I, it must have been magnificent but here's the deal the scripture says he woke up and he said he sang it surely the presence of the Lord was in this place but what was his what was the other part I didn't know it I didn't know it but he said I don't want to forget this and so what the Bible says is he made an oath or he made a commitment. He says, I'm going to call this place something. Does anybody remember what he called it? Hmm, Bethel. And the word Bethel means house of God. He never wanted to forget what happened there. And so then he goes on and he lives with Laban. Remember that? The little trials and tribulations he went through? Good-looking lady and not such a good-looking... No, I should better be careful there. But the bottom line is, you know, he had his, his, his deals... After 20 years, remember what happened? Laban starts getting on him a little bit because, you know, he sees that God's blessing him and, and he wants to cut a cut in the action. Well, what it causes there is a season of transition. Literally. God's moving him out. And one of the ways that he's doing is he's upsetting the house a little bit. Well, to make a long story short, he's got to go, he wants to go back to the original homestead because he's got the birthright. Got it? But what's he thinking? He probably thought this many times, probably every week, if not every month, if not every day. I wonder if Esau has gotten over it yet. <laughs> Come on, I would have been thinking that. And so here he's coming back into the land. He's going over. He's right over the, the brook Jabbok, I think is what it's called. And he comes to another season or another transition in his life. Bethel's one transition. There really is a God. And I really didn't know he was here, but I don't want that to happen again. Well, he's coming into another transition in his life, and what it is is the Bible says he splits up his family. He says, well, if Esau's really mad, he's going to go after my family. And so I want to prepare this. At least I got half of them that'll, that'll, that'll end up alive. 
And the bottom line is he remains there. Remember that? How he struggled with that angel. Well, do you know what the name of the place was? Does anybody know what the place, the name, the first place was Bethel, house of God. The second place was what? Does anybody know what that name was? Study it for yourself. I think it's the 34th chapter of the book of Genesis. Peniel. And do you know what Peniel means? Does anybody know what the Peniel means? Okay, I'll tell you. The face of God. So what's he transitioning to? Not only did he know the presence of God, which a lot of people do, but how about the face of God? How about coming face to face to the reality of what's happening in your life? See, that's what Jacob had to do. Now, I'm not saying he became this perfect man after that episode, but I believe personally he became a better man. And that's what God does. He's got already custom-made transitions for your life. And you and I, first thing I'm going to pray for for you tonight is that you will recognize it. I got a feeling that 2018 is going to be that year for some of you. This is going to be a transition year. This is going to be a time when some things in your life that maybe you've been struggling with for way too long, by the way, are going to start getting right. And you're going to start walking with God like you have never walked with him before. But I got a feeling it's going to be a face-to-face -face thing. It's not going to be one of these, oh, yeah, I know I'm coming to church because, boy, the presence of God is in there. And, man, that guy, that mouthy little preacher gets up and he preaches. And, boy, I mean, I don't agree with half of what he's saying. But, boy, I can't argue with his anointing, you know. And I don't know what else is going on out there, but it is whatever, you know. But the bottom line is you're going to come face-to-face -face with God. And you're going to realize, man, he is almighty God. And you know what happened to Jacob at Peniel? Oh, man, I'm, I'm wasting a good sermon, but I'll let somebody know this. One of the things that happened in that episode is he, come on, he struck his hip, and Jacob became a permanent cripple. I preach a sermon about this whole thing. I'm just ruining this tonight for you, okay? But I preach this. You know what I call it? Don't trust anybody who doesn't have a limp. Because Jacob had a limp after that. And you want to know what it was for? It was so that he could remember that episode with God. You see, that's one of the things that God wants to do in our life. He doesn't want us forgetting what he's doing. And that's why he will do life-changing things to us. You can say what you want about Jacob. No, he wasn't perfect, but I believe he became better because of the episodes that God put in his life. And at the beginning of this session, these sessions, these next three or four sessions, I believe that's what God wants to institute in your life. Life changing things in Jesus' name. Now, come on, do you agree that 2018 can be that year? Why don't you stand with me right now? Come on, let's stand. And I'm going to pray. And why don't you pray with me if you would? You can do that if you want. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray tonight, Lord God. I know this has been pretty deep, but there's some folks here tonight that are ready for this. And I'm asking you to help us tonight, Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord God, to recognize these seasons that you're bringing us to. Help us to recognize the transition that's happening. How that the things and the love for the fleshly things things are going away and the thing and the love for the spiritual things are beginning to build up in our lives that's on purpose God you're helping us with that you're pouring grace into our lives so that we can overcome in the name of Jesus help us tonight Lord God I would pray first of all nobody would be offended by this that Lord God we'd get over that one in a hurry that Lord God you love us and you're making your love more available to us through sessions like this and help us to receive that love. Help us to be built up upon our most holy faith, praying in the spirit, loving you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Help us to do that, Lord God. Help us to grasp everything that you've made available to us, even here tonight. Let these seeds, Lord God, fall on those good ground in the name of Jesus. And I give you the praise. I do, Lord. I'm so glad that I'm a part of this. I am, Lord God. This is the 
the best place in the world to be. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else but in your kingdom, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Touch us, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to get rid of that bitterness and that profane feeling that we have sometime that the world is better than you. Help us to get rid of that. Help us to rinse, rinse and cleanse us from that type of thing. In the name of Jesus, to appreciate you and your word and your spirit more than anything else, Lord God. Help us to push into that type of a season in the name of Jesus. And I give you the praise and the glory, Lord God. I'm so thankful again, Lord God, that we can do this. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's take another 10 seconds and let's lift both of our hands right now and let's just give God the praise Give him the glory. Say, God, yes, your way is always better than mine. Mm, hallelujah. You're greater than addiction. You're greater than riches. You're greater than anything, Lord God. Yes. Oh, yes, Lord. You're greater. Greater. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Come on. We got greater. Greater. Oh my, Yalemato, Roba Kasai, Yalemama Mono. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. You're greater, Lord God. You're greater than anything. Anything, Lord God. Everything. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let the spirit of encouragement come on every person. Let the spirit of encouragement. We can do this. You designed this to work, God. You designed this to work. There's no reason why it won't work. Come on. You've designed this to work for everybody. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. All of your creation was designed with this purpose. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's why in your life, in my life, in your life, my life, you'll have what I call short-term projects, and then you'll have long-term projects. One of the long-term projects that we all have is the Bible says that, you know, all things together work for good to those that are called according to his purpose and who love the Lord. But then it talks about we are being conformed into his image. And that image is the image of Jesus Christ. That is the long-term project. He is conforming us into his image. That's what's happening. And that's why you're going to go through many seasons that will have a little bitty pieces of that conforming to Jesus' image in it. But it'll have other things that will work out and stuff like that. But that conforming to his image is what's happening. That's the big project, praise God. That's why you and I have to, have to, have to sign up for the long haul. That one doesn't happen after uh, 10 years. It doesn't happen after 20 years or 30 years or 40 years or 50 years. No matter how many years you live on this earth, it's going to take your entire lifetime. And then there's still going to be a little bit left. And the Bible says in a min minute, in a, t in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed just like like that. Praise God. We're going to see him as he is, and as he is, we're going to be like. That's what's going to happen. Praise God. And I don't know if you're going to have 10%, 20%, 50% left. I don't know. That's between you and God. But all I'm saying is that's the big project. That's what's happening. And God has given us the privilege to be in a place in a time where that happens, where that can happen. This is designed to work, folks. Don't let anybody tell you it isn't. That's one of the deceptions of the devil. It's, well, you know, it works for him because, they, you know, he really needed, you know. No, it works for everybody. Oh, I got to let you go. But this is good. Thank you for staying. That, that shows me a lot, of, a lot of maturity right there. Oh, you can preach right at him, man. And that's what it is. What is it, Sister Carnahan? Oh, we did. We do. Who is that? Uh -huh. You know, and you were going to try to get away with this. You, were, you thought you had it done, didn't you? You did. And she's the one that's promoting everybody else's birthday. Oh, I think we got to sing for a good half an hour or something. Oh, we appreciate you, Barb. And that's a good way to get me to quit. 
is for you to come up here and, and we'll sing happy birthday, praise God, to you and whoever else is close and that type of thing. But we appreciate birthdays. They're a good thing. No, 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 no. That doesn't work. You know, you got to come up here. This is like a personal altar call. Personal altar call. You get your own altar call when you have a birthday in this church in Jesus' name. Rest of you, thank you for coming. Remember Sunday, the bread breakfast, that type of thing. But let's sing a uh, happy birthday to Sister Barb in Jesus' name. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus near every day of the year. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. And the best year you've ever Sister Barb, we appreciate her. And the rest of you, God bless you folks in Jesus' name. <clears throat>